So Crystal, I was thinking about your title, Chief Resilience Officer. That's a very cool title. And then I was thinking about your place, Tulsa. I've been there. Very cool place. So uh, put those together and you seem like you're a person that's really about making a difference. Tell me a little bit about how you ended up being the Chief Resilience Officer in the city of yeah. Tulsa. So I would say, you know, it was an initiative out of another foundation. The Rockefeller Foundation yeah. launched an initiative called 100 Resilient Cities. Oh yeah, I read about that. Yep. Yeah. So Tulsa was one of those early cities that adopted that and kind of a few things happened with that initiative. The cities that were involved created a role called Chief Resilience Officer and also no pressure on that title. <laughs> Must be resilient. Uh, yeah. Um, we created uh, resilient strategies. So all these cities have a document that lays out what um, they're gonna do to build a resilient, uh, inclusive, equitable city. And um, all have offices. So yeah. in Tulsa, um, the Mayor's Office of Resilience and Equity was created in 2018 with this role. Um, and we have a strategy which I'm currently in the process of implementing. And so do you chief resilience officers ever connect with one another? Is it a community or is yes, it? Yes, absolutely, yeah. yeah we're. Um, we're on everything from a WhatsApp group where yeah. we exchange literally daily ideas, things we're grappling with, trading spreadsheets on you know how to implement something um, to regional convenings. So we actually I have continued building a network of resilience officers and resilience practitioners. Uh, the Rockefeller Foundation yeah. uh, kind of sunsetted that initiative formally in their in their institute, but um, we've created a city-led network called the Resilient Cities Network. Oh wow! Now there must be diff widely different approaches because cities have to be resilient mm -hmm. in the face of different challenges. Yeah. Um, and then I imagine that somewhere in the mix, building good resiliency also requires trust. Absolutely. How do those two work together? Yeah. Well, I love that you, that you kind of caught on to that very quickly, <laughs> yeah. that every city will be different. Every resilient strategy will have its own actions and strategies yeah. within it. Um, but I would say that the kind of definition that we all use, we're all... We're, we're all on the same page about that. So yeah. building a resilient city means that we are, um, our city overall, our institutions, businesses, organizations, can survive, adapt, and thrive through chronic stressors or acute shocks. Oof. So building a resilient city means that we can do, we can do that, and our actions reflect that. Um, I would say that there's a kind of a cadre of cities, uh, in Tulsa's part, that we led with racial equity in our resilience strategy. So um, it wasn't sort of, in, kind of an afterthought or wasn't sort of a kind of add-on or there's actions yeah. specifically related to racial equity, our whole strategy has that lens. Um, and that's why, really why I decided to move to Tulsa to do the work. Yeah, so that was a, a big move. You were playing a very important role in New York City government for a number of years. I think if I got this right, having grown up and uh, moved to Illinois from Mexico City but, with your born families. Born in Mel Moline, Illinois. Oh, you were yes. born in the yes. U.S. Yeah. Your parents moved. Yep. Yep. Uh, and then off to NYU for college yep. uh, and also graduate school, I think. Yep. And then you worked in the Bloomberg administration. Mm -hmm. So uh, what were you doing those first years in city government in New York, which we should call that almost like metropolis government, the mm -hmm. big, biggest city in the United States. Uh, what, what was your work? Yeah, so I, I had the, the privilege of working with the deputy mayor who oversaw health and human services. Yeah. And um, in New York City, unlike other cities, there's lots of deputy mayors because yeah. there's lots of people and lots of departments. And so I was a senior policy advisor working on child and family issues. Yeah. Um, so I worked closely with our child welfare agency, our housing um, and homelessness, um, our health department, health and hospitals, and then our nonprofits as well to to build you know um, programs and initiatives to support our, our families. The Bloomberg administration is known for really modernizing government partnerships in all kinds of ways: the arts, education reform, uh, criminal justice, early childhood, all these different areas. Mm -hmm. they, I, I, I've read about that. What did you take away? from your experience in that administration that you've been able to use in Tulsa? Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, you know, you, you want to balance, you know, bringing your ideas from a very large city yeah. to some a place that's more midsize, um, but you also want to bring the good ideas. You don't yeah. want to be, uh, you want to be humble about it because yeah. um, the resources in New York City are very different than the resources yeah. in many other cities. And so um, I would say one of the, one of the great things that um, I learned was about data and the importance of disparity data. 
Um, during the Bloomberg administration, um, Mayor Bloomberg launched the Young Men's Initiative, which yeah. has you know, now uh, become much broader. But that was one of the first times where we looked at disparity data across mm -hmm. different indicators. Um, and so in Tulsa, when um, the mayor launched the Resilience Strategy and launched the Equality Indicators Report, this was right up our alley, yeah. but it still is not a lot of cities that are adopting this type of work to look at disparity data over time. Yeah. So here's a question. So how does disparity data help build or possibly help erode trust? Mm -hmm. So our quality indicators report, um, we've released it every year since 2018. So now we have about okay. five years of data. Um, in the I would say in the first years, and this is an example of growing and learning, in the first yeah. years it was really a report of the disparities. Um, equality indicators are a little bit different in that they measure the disparity between two groups, and that could be two racial groups, two, uh, two genders, it could be yeah. veterans, non-veterans. It really is uh, a look at the most, uh, the highest disparities yeah. and then tracking those over time. So it's not an average in, yeah. across the whole city. Um, and so when we first released it in the first couple of years, it really was like, here's the data. And then, you know, it's just like bad news. <laughs> and so um, over, the, over the years, we've added more context. We've added discussions around the root causes of these disparities. We really added a racial equity lens to talking about disparity yeah. data. And we've added um, learning series so that the book or the report is not just released and out there and then people look at it and are grappling with understanding it or um, upset at, at not seeing progress. That We've coupled a learning series where we bring in nonprofit stakeholders, uh, non uh, businesses to learn about the data and also to connect with each other on um, the, the activities that are addressing those disparities. So you have to have both because if you just release disparity data, um, you know, you, you, you have to couple it with the action. No. So you've helped to play a major role in the equity dialogues in Tulsa. And this comes to the context of a city that had an enormous traumatic massacre uh, in 1921. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question of racial equity is maybe always on the table because of the, the past mm -hmm. um, and other things in the past as well. Tell me a little bit about those dialogues. What, yeah. How are they structured? What was their goal? And do you think they're playing a role in, in reweaving community or building trust? Mm -hmm. I think they are playing a role. They're a tool that we have in the city, yeah. in, in city government, and actually, you know, any any city government can can implement this tool. I would say that the equity dialogues um, are part of our normalizing conversations around racial equity, racism, structural racism, um, and just talking about these issues. So, we, who's in the dialogues? Sure. Yeah. So, um, anybody. We recruit anyone in Tulsa who wants to have that conversation. Um, so we issue a press release, we do social media, we recruit that way, we, we hand out flyers. Um, and the, each dialogue is 90 minutes. We've had them on Zoom, we've had them in person in restaurants, we've had them in libraries. And um, 90 minutes of conversation facilitated by two trained facilitators that are from the community. Um, and they go through a four part process. And the, really, you asked what the goal was. Yeah. Um, it's connection and um, normalizing these conversations. Yeah. But also, one thing that we, I don't think we wrote it in in the first iteration, we didn't realize, we're building leaders in our community yeah. that know about government and have connected and, and built trust with our office and, and others. And so we're, we're seeing kind of the, out, the outcomes kind of expand yeah. beyond our original goals. So ballpark, how many dialogues have taken place? Yeah. We've had over 40. Um, yeah. Sometimes uh, our numbers are a little fuzzy because uh, when we were on Zoom, we would break up yeah. into breakout groups. But um, And we've reached nearly 500 people, and about 100 people are trained in yeah. the city of Tulsa. That can Who do did that. the training? We partnered with a local university. Yeah. We thought, so that was actually one of our um, kind of adjustments, iterations over the years. The first year, we literally had people go to 27 restaurants and no facilitator. Yeah. I think we might have had three questions on the table. Um, yeah. Everyone had different meals. <laughs> yeah. And so we decided to um, get some feedback. And one of the things that community members who participated said they wanted was to have a facilitator. Um, and so we worked with OSU's um, Center uh, for Public Life at the time, and they created an eight-hour training. So everyone who gets trained knows about um, uh, DEI issues. They know about um, unconscious bias. They learn about um, the city and racial equity, uh, and then they practice facilitation. 
and uh, they get a certificate yeah. from OSU. Yeah. And that's another kind of principle in our office is that we're building capacity. Like I want to see equity dialogue training on people's resumes and then they can use that to, um, to get other positions or you know, can, can be yeah. qualified for other leadership roles. So do you curate the group so that the group itself represents you anticipate a range of experiences and perspectives? Yeah, so we've, as I said, the, the equity dialogues we've iterated over time. Yeah. Um, a few times we ask um, in our registration form, we actually ask about people's race, ethnicity, gender, uh, age, their zip code. Yeah. And then we asked a question, um, you know, name the five people, or I think about the five people closest to you. Are they similar in race and ethnicity to you? Are they different, yeah. or is it a mix? And so we use that data to kind of create kind of diverse groups. Yeah. Um, but sometimes, you know, when we did them on Zoom, we just kind of randomly put people into the breakout room. So, but yes, the point is that we're bringing people together that would, would you know, not have conversations yeah. like this with someone who is maybe of a different race or ethnicity or language group. There's an important study that came out about a year and a half ago from Dartmouth that shows that those conversations actually can bring about change of perspective, a rounding of perspective, the ability to understand another's point of view, a softening, if you will, of, mm -hmm. of sort of total confidence, one's own opinion, um, and that one of the things to be avoided is having a disruptor in the dialogue that prevents it from happening. Mm. I don't know if you've ever anticip anticipated yeah. that or had that challenge in the building of the dialogue. But do you feel people are able to leave and feel that they've grown from it? Oh, yeah. I mean, some of the anecdotal evidence, yeah. you know, we talked about how do we measure this. Yeah, we talk about that a lot. But some of the anecdotal evidence is that there are people who have met in the dialogues. Um, you know, that's a 90-minute conversation. Yeah. It's structured. You're in a public space. Um, but the connections that were made have lasted. So I know one group, one dyad, that uh, continues to meet for coffee monthly yeah. because they met in the dialogue. They don't have anything in common career-wise, where they live, um, but they yeah. met in the dialogue and continue yeah. to meet. And I would say um, sometimes the groups, uh, you know, and the ones that I participated in or gotten a chance to participate in, um, they really gel afterwards and kind of want to st stick yeah. together and, and keep in touch. Yeah. So hard, hard question, doesn't have a single answer, but sometimes people say, well, we shouldn't have dialogues on really difficult historical or present day issues that blend together because um, it just surfaces like old wounds, uh, you know, breaks open scabs, it makes people mm -hmm. upset. They, people think, I, didn't, I wasn't responsible for that problem. Mm -hmm. Why am I feeling defensive about it now? Mm -hmm. You've probably worked through those kinds of questions. Mm -hmm and maybe dealt with some skeptics. And you know, how do we answer that question about let, the, let bygones be bygones? Well, there's a couple things. One is uh, when you don't talk about something, you're talking about it, yeah. whether you're using words or not. And so um, the issue, the history, the trauma um, is in the room, in the conversation, whether we're talking yeah. about it or not. And then the other is that um, you know, the past, we have to understand what happened. Um, and we have to understand that the disparities we see now are policy, the results of policies, decisions, um, activities that were done yeah. generations before. And so dismantling these issues will not, you know, will not be easy and quick. Um, and so I think that helps people understand when you know, government is trying to do something that we can't uh, expect quick, yeah. quick solutions. But talking about the past, um, you know, I think it's healing. It can be healing, um, but it doesn't always have to be comfortable. Yeah. And I think that's um, what our training, we, we emphasize that uh, it's not necessarily a comfortable space, but it is a brave space and a safe space. Yeah. And everyone who comes to those dialogues is wanting to have the conversation, either because they have the conversation all the time and they, they want to continue having it, or they've never had the opportunity to have a conversation about racism, their experience of racism, yep. whether they're a person of color or they're white. Um, and so, you know, just I'm, you know, in my head, I'm just thinking through all the amazing dialogues and those connections that have been made when yep. people just hear the experience of others in that conversation. Yep. We, well, the Aspen Institute's had the chance to go to Tulsa a couple of times. We've worked with the community college, we've worked with the mm -hmm. University of Tulsa. And then with the support of the Koretz Family yep. Foundation, we had a chance to visit last year. I went my mm -hmm. first trip. I was really blown away. 
with a community spirit. Um, a lot of people moving to Tulsa, people living in Tulsa, proud of Tulsa, that nice fusion of newer like you and uh, long term. I went to Greenwood Rising, I thought that was so sophisticated and yeah. thoughtful, the way it brought the past into the present in a way that was mm -hmm. a learning experience. And I met a lot of community leaders working on the ground, on economic development, on uh, legal issues, on providing holistic childcare. Um, the chance to learn about all the ways that Tulsa is building together, its future was really mm -hmm. inspiring. Um, you know, you get that inspiration, you want to do more. We're trying to figure out what, what else could the Institute do. But how do you think about the role of organizations that are civil society, like us, nonprofits, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. possibly coming to a community in partnership, definitely as listeners? Uh, is, there, is there a role for organizations like ours? Oh, well, I would say yes yeah. is a simple answer. Yeah. And I think that you're, you know, um, Someone, someone said, we don't go where we're not invited. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of a, can I just say yeah, you're invited? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. It's official. <laughs> yes. Thank I you. think so, you know, at the top of the conversation, you asked like kind of the New York City, Tulsa difference. Yeah. And, you know, when I first arrived in Tulsa, I thought, okay, where's the budget for people, right? Yeah. And I think in, in cities kind of in this part of the country or um, because of how funding works, you know, cities really mainly fund the hard surface things I call, yeah. like the streets, stormwater, the lights, you know, um, buildings, um, and the health and human services is really kind of part of philanthropy or nonprofit yeah. sector and funded through philanthropy. Our mm -hmm. United Way, for example, raises $26 million each year yeah. for our nonprofits. Yeah. That's like That's one of the huge. highest, yeah, one of the, the biggest campaigns in United Way. And so I would say we absolutely in Tulsa ha need to have partnerships with local organizations and national yeah. funders, or national organizations. Um, and I would say we, our office has benefited from our national networks. We are part of a financial empowerment network. We're part of the Resilient Cities Network. Um, lots of things related to the Bloomberg uh, initiatives uh, across procurement, civic engagement. So Tulsa is a city. Uh, our vision is to be a world-class city. And we can't do that with ideas that are just in Tulsa. Yeah. We need to look at best practices outside. Well, we've certainly enjoyed working with Bloomberg Philanthropies each year to create Bloomberg City Lab, which is mm -hmm. how, you know, of course, yes. how we met. Uh, Ten years of doing that, of bringing together mayors and many others within municipal governments to share best and promising practices. And you've been, you've come here. Um, is there anything you're taking away from seeing all these leaders from different places around the world uh, sharing information about how they're leading their communities? Yeah, I would say I love the fact that there's more of a conversation around participatory civic engagement yeah. in in city government. Um, it's something that it's in my background, having tra been trained in participatory action research and doing a lot of community work in New York and bringing that lens here. But I just love that it's being formalized, that, that there's a kind of research and study and practice around civic engagement. And I think that that really is a part of um, what will maintain and build our yep. democracy, like to have civic engagement, people engage with our government and, and having the trust. Yeah. So that's what makes me excited. Yeah. Um are there any other things you've done in Tulsa around civic engagement, inclusion, that you really feel have, have really moved the ball and made it different mm -hmm. to people's lives? Yeah, well, our resilience strategy was launched in 2018. That includes 41 programs, policies, practice changes, and yeah. events, and we're in the process of implementing all, all those. Um, around the same time, the mayor also launched a immigrant and refugee inclusion initiative, and we call it our Tulsa, New Tulsans Initiative Welcoming Plan. And I would say those two, those two initiatives are under my office as, as well, and I would say that is a game changer for Tulsa. Um, it is about creating a city that is welcoming. Um, and we're not talking federal immigration reform. We kind of say federal immigration policy happens at the federal level, but welcoming happens at the city level. Yeah. And we are really committed to creating a welcoming city for all. Um, has, uh, how does the immigrant community contribute to the growth and life and future of Tulsa? Oh my gosh, it's not even a question. It's uh, our, our city is very diverse. About 10% of our um, our community is uh, foreign born, yeah. about 17% 70, Latino. Um, our Asian community is growing. And I'll just say, you know, in, in recent weeks, um, we've launched an Asian commission. We didn't yeah. have that in the city of Tulsa. Um, and we also uh, did equity dialogue training where we recruited bilingual, bicultural individuals. Yeah. 
because we don't want to have separate dialogues for people who speak English or, or Hmong or Burmese. We want to have everyone together. So we're trying to move towards inclusion um, instead of just uh, kind of accepting the diversity. Like there's a, yeah. a step beyond that that we need to do. And yeah. so that's what we're focused on. Fantastic. Um, and as you do that work, have you been able to form any learning relationships with other communities that are that give, give you good models or, or maybe they're learning from you as you yeah. uh, promote a more uh, inclusive multicultural community? Absolutely. I think um, one thing that we, we always talk about is like we want to say we're these things. We're resilient. We're yeah. a smart city. Huh. We're a welcoming city. But how do we measure that? And yeah. what is that really like? We can't just say ourselves. Um, um, and so being part of those national networks is very important. Um, and the city of Tulsa is working on getting certified as a welcoming city from a national organization called Welcoming America. Nice. So those are, you know, those are ways nice. that have been very helpful to us. Um, and we use other other metrics as yeah. well for other inclusion, our LGBTQ inclusion um, and the resilience work. So, you know, uh, it's, it, it's exciting to meet a younger colleague like you who's dedicated your entire professional career to making a difference and who sees the levers of government as mm -hmm. productive and positive and useful. There's so much cynicism about government. Yeah. Um, and of course, we have to deliver. It's not just talk, and yeah. you're really working to that. Um, but over your career now, as you've really built such an impressive record, do you, has, how has your faith in, trust in, uh, American democracy and the functioning of government at local level, has that evolved? Ooh, yeah. yeah. I, get, I think that question, I didn't really think about early in yeah. my career. I thought, you know, I, I started off in the nonprofit world in, in New York City and then went to government. Um, but, you know, I think back to um, kind of a quote related to human rights that Eleanor Roosevelt said in the United Nations in like 1953. And she said, you know, where do human rights matter? They matter in people's homes, the school, where they pick up their food. You know, if things don't matter there, we are looking in vain for progress in the larger world. Yeah. And I just love that because it points to the importance of local government um, making a difference in the direct, in directly in people's lives. And so we need people from diverse backgrounds to be in government. Um, it can't just be a homogenous group or, yeah. or a legacy, you know. Um, and so, you know, it's hard work, you know, it's, I think people probably need to take breaks when they're in government, um, but I encourage people to join. If you wanna make the most impact, um, you know, citywide or large, you know, population-wide, like join city government. Um, also, it's a place where when you're a young person, you get a big job. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you yeah. know, you mentioned yeah. my work in New York City, I was, you know, very, you know, younger <laughs> back then, yeah. um, but you learn so much. Um, and if you're humble, you can take those lessons and, and really make a difference and yeah. continue to contribute and, and make, you know, cities the best they can be. Yeah, lovely. Well, th um, you know, I, I, I'll maybe close with a thought for now. Uh, I was in New York City, your, in your, your former city, maybe six, eight months ago, and I hopped into an Uber. and the driver and I started talking and he shared he was from Korea. I said, well, what, what, how'd you come here? Oh, my mom and I came when I was younger. And he was um, getting an education and he was driving Ubers as well. I said, well, you know, what made you decide to drive an Uber? I thought he was gonna say, well, it was like, you know, like I have to have a job. That was probably part of it. But he said, well, about seven years ago, I, I got into an Uber for the first time. And I sat in the back, called, you know, called it on my app and sat in the back. I couldn't believe it the way it changed, the difference. I felt like I was living in the future. Hmm. And so I wanted to drive for Uber. Well, when I listen to you talk, I feel like I'm living in the future of how government is going to connect with community, build trust, make a difference, okay. and deliver results. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me.